Hi, welcome. Uh, thanks for staying this late into Java 1, uh, last slot on the last day. We know that uh, we're the only thing standing between you and happy hour, so um, we'll try to get through this and um, appreciate you being here. So I'm Randy Stafford, I'm from Oracle, and this is Chris Davis from Nike. And our topic today is NoSQL usage patterns in Java enterprise applications. So uh, in terms of an agenda, just at a very high level of detail, uh, we wanted to start out with a little bit of context setting, um, maybe uh, go through some of the terms we're using, and then we'll get into the sort of the meat of the usage patterns. And uh, we have a pretty extended example from Chris uh, of what he's done up there in Portland. And finally, we'll uh, try and save some time at the end for discussion and uh, Q&A session. So with that, uh, let me uh, allow Chris to give himself a little bit deeper introduction. How's it going? I'm Chris Davis, uh, direct, one of the directors of engineering at Nike for Nike Plus. So if you think Nike, you think shoes, or a lot of other stuff too. Uh, the platform that I've been working on is everything Nike Plus, so the fuel band, GPS apps, uh, shoes, Connect training is coming out, and behind all this is our big scalable platform that has to deal with all this data in a NoSQL way. Do any of you out there in the audience uh, happen to be wearing a Nike Fuel Band at the moment? Really? Okay, we got to get Nike down to the conference next year. Um, and I'm Randy Stafford. I've been with. Uh, Oracle for seven years. Um, I've had this kind of bad habit of flipping back and forth between technology vendors and technology consumers in my career. Um, I'm on the Coherence product development team and uh, prior to this I was with a company called IQ Navigator as their chief architect. I've done some publishing along the way, uh, contributed the service layer pattern to Martin Fowler's uh, Patterns of Enterprise Application Architecture book and enjoy speaking at conferences. So uh, I also want to acknowledge um, Mick Quinlan, who was going to be a uh, co-presenter here. I, I invited him to co-present, but he had a conflict and, and couldn't make it. Um, Mick uh, developed the architecture drawn here. It's, it's the only system that I know of that's using both Hadoop and a data grid in the same production architecture. Um, maybe Is anyone out there in the audience doing a similar thing? Do you, you have Hadoop and a data grid in production? Okay, so this is pretty unique. This has been in uh, smooth production operation for three years now, and um, Nick or Mick was kind enough to um, sort of review the outline for this talk and make sure that it sort of passed his uh, sniff test. Okay, so let's get started with the, the context setting. Um, I want to just sort of deconstruct the title of the talk a little bit and uh, sort of go over NoSQL um, and relationship to data grids and uh, go over what we mean by usage patterns, what we mean by enterprise applications. So let's start with NoSQL. Um, I, I'm sure you've heard the term. Uh, it's probably what, what drew you here. So under the NoSQL umbrella, there are generally recognized to be four uh, broad categories of data management technology, key value stores, document stores, column family stores, and graph databases. And one of the questions that seems to be on people's minds or certain people's minds over the last year or more is where do in-memory data grids fit? How do they relate to NoSQL? And I, I'm prepared to give my opinion on that here. Um, I think there's some overlap and there's some um, difference. And I, I think I've gathered the same opinion this week from um, other folks like Monik Sertani of, of JBoss and from what I've seen of uh, Gemfire's chief architect, Jags Ram Narayan, he generally shares, shares the same opinion. So uh, how many of you have seen Martin Fowler's new book, uh, No Sequel Distilled? How many of you are aware of this? Um, I, I think this is very valuable. Um, I finally, it's, it's been in print for a month, and I finally read it cover to cover. Uh, it has very good treatment of um, the various data models that, I, that were on the previous slide, um, consistency, terminology, distribution models, etc. So um, I'm happy to, to give his book a plug. I, I think it'll probably serve as a, a good reference for um, the meanings of a lot of these terms. So in, in the first few chapters of the book, Martin lays out what, what he regards as the common characteristics of NoSQL solutions. Um, First of all, they don't use SQL as a query language. Um, 
Second of all, they, they tend to be open source. Uh, they're explicitly designed to run on clusters um, that from the beginning, for the most part. They were developed in, in the 2000s, uh, usually for large web estates, and they are generally schemaless. Um, so he, he further points out that none of these characteristics are uh, definitional, and he says that he doesn't think that uh, there, there would ever be a you know, perfectly accepted definition of NoSQL. So when you, um, oh, and before I go on, let me, let me point out that one thing that's notably missing from this list is persistence or durability. And a few nights back, at uh, there, there was a Birds of a Feather session on JSR 347, led by uh, Monik Sertani. And I uh, asked the, the room, uh, how, many of you, or, you know, how many of you think that a, a, a data management technology must implement persistence in order to be regarded as a NoSQL technology? And there, weren't, there wasn't a strong opinion about that. I asked Monik if he considered InfiniSpan to be NoSQL, and he said yes. And I said, does it implement persistence? And he said no. Or he said yes. And I, I said, how does it implement persistence? And he said, well, we have a, a cache store um, SPI. Uh, so th there's, th when you look at the data grid products out there, there are a couple of them that implement uh, file-based, or there's at least one of them that implements file-based persistence for um, its caches. And most of them have data source integration through a cache store. So I think there's a, a little bit of a consensus emerging here. And when you compare the features of, or the characteristics of in-memory data grids against that list of common characteristics in, in Fowler's NoSQL Distilled book, in-memory data grids generally don't use SQL. Um, some of them are open source, some of them aren't. They, they are definitely designed to run on clusters. They were definitely developed in the 21st century. Um, the oldest one of these products is Tangasol Coherence, now, now Oracle Coherence. Um, Tangasol was founded in 2000. Release 1.0 of Coherence was uh, late 2001, so the product is almost 11 years old now. Um, and the, the existing data grid products are schemaless. So then when you look at the data model of an in-memory data grid and you compare it to the categories of NoSQL product, um, in, in my estimation, in-memory data grid products tend to implement key value store behavior, you know, particularly coherence, for example. Um, and they also tend to implement document store behavior um, as, as described in NoSQL Distilled. They don't really implement column family store functionality or graph database functionality so much, but they also bring some features of their own that are quite useful and, and quite distinct from the other NoSQL products. They, they implement rich eventing models. Uh, they implement in-place processing facilities, the, the analog of stored procedures. Um, and they tend to have data source integration features such as the, the cache store uh, previously mentioned. So uh, that's some of the um, overlap of the two categories. So I want to move on in terms of context setting and talk a little bit about patterns. Um, I, put a, I put up here a favorite quote of mine on, on the value of patterns from Kent Beck. This was written in 1996. Um, He's saying the bottleneck in software engineering is human communication. And if we can um, make a word mean more to more people, that, that improves communication. There's a, another quote, this one from Brad Appleton. Um, Brad's kind of a longtime figure in the patterns world. He's the author, one of the authors of a book called Software Configuration Management Patterns. So if you've ever used the term re release branch or task branch, that's a, a pattern that he documented in that book, and uh, it perfectly illustrates his point. If, if you know what release branch and task branch means, then you know, the name of the pattern is a conceptual handle for you that um, allows you to discuss that little nugget of information. So what about usage patterns? I, I did want to delve into this a little bit because we, we use the term usage pattern kind of freely, and I, I tried to find a definition of it, and. Um, is particularly applicable to software development and didn't really come across anything. So obviously a usage pattern is a, a pattern of using something. Um, and I think we, we mean a pattern of using a software technology in an enterprise application and more specifically um, well-established and, and proven usage patterns. Um, 
patterns that almost always you know, satisfy the motivation for adopting them in the first place. And this ultimately leads to evolution of common practice. And so I, uh, I'm a Far Side fan, and I picked out one of my favorite Far Side cartoons that kind of captures this sentiment. You know, here's a, here's a bunch of cavemen holding pieces of meat over a fire and burning their hands, and then somebody else figures out to, to put the piece of meat on a stick, and then you can cook it without burning your hands. I think this is, you know, it was very analogous to what's happening with uh, in-memory data grids, um, Hadoop, et cetera. We're coming up with uh, better practices for solving problems. So finally, a little bit on enterprise applications. Um, this is a pretty old definition. Uh, this is from Fowler's Patterns of Enterprise Application Architecture. Enterprise applications are applications that have large amounts of persistent data, concurrent access by many users. Um, for example, do any of you in the room play League of Legends by Riot Games? Yes, no, maybe. They, they, they have 500,000 concurrent users and their, um, their number of concurrent users is doubling every four months, and the rate of doubling is increasing. I, I think that will end somewhere. It'll, it'll hit, a, hit an asymptote, but um, enterprise apps tend to have many user interface pages, um, complex integrations with other systems, complex logic. These were Martin's characteristics. I have a few of my own that I like to throw in. Um, a complex domain model, uh, heavy load, and transaction volume. Uh, you, you guys know this. You're probably enterprise application developers yourselves. No surprise here. Um, so in addition, in terms of enterprise applications, I think there's reasonably well accepted layering models for how they're architected. Um, I've seen it drawn different ways, but I, I chose to draw it this way. I, I suppose uh, from the bottom up, there's, there's a persistence layer. Um, you may have a layer of, of domain objects. You may have a layer of services. And one of the sort of newer things to come along with SOA is an orchestration layer or mediation layer, like you have a, you know, a, a business process management technology in there or maybe an enterprise service bus technology in there. And then finally, user interface layers on top. And I've drawn a few dashed lines where there's uh, process boundaries in, in this stack. The reason I'm pointing this out is because um, later we'll come back and we'll talk about where the usage patterns fit with respect to these layering models. And this is actually kind of quaint because in a real data center, what's happening is there's, there's an instance of this layer stack um, scaled out horizontally, and there might even be multi-site active active architectures and so forth. So the complexity has grown in the last decade since uh, this stuff was first drawn. So uh, that's the context setting. Um, and I'd like to get into the usage patterns now. So here they, here they are. Um, in terms of how they fit against architecture layers. Obviously, you know, I think the, the birth of all this is that NoSQL and in-memory data grid technologies um, have, a, have a heavy um, adoption in terms of domain object storage. These technologies are used to store domain objects near the persistence layer of an application. In addition, um, they are used for service response caching. Um, and I have detailed slides on, on all these, of course. So uh, either a user interface or maybe a, a, an ESB or business process management layer might call some kind of a service, get a response back, cache it, et cetera. These technologies are also used for session state management. Um, this is a, a pretty common use case. Um, offloading application server heaps um, w and moving the session state into a different place so that it can be shared and, and uh, the concurrent usage scaled. And there are a couple of other um, less obvious ones that people are doing. Uh, work management, uh, basically coordinating um, uh, a set of, of workers that are, that are doing jobs and tasks. Uh, simple state sharing. Um, and I, I drew these in association with the service layer of an application because that seemed like the right place to put it. And finally, uh, we're starting to see, and, and Chris will talk about this a little bit, we're starting to see examples of NoSQL technology or data grid technology um, get used for enterprise integration in preference to other alternative technologies that, that were used before. So in, in terms of prevalence, um, prevalence of both these patterns and, and the motivations for using these patterns, I, I've made two lists here. There's not any implied correlation between the list. 
lists of um, the patterns by prevalence of usage in decreasing order and the motivations um, for using these, these um, technologies in decreasing order. So just starting on the, on the usage pattern side, as we already observed, domain object storage I think is the top usage pattern for these kind of technologies. Session state management is the one that I see next, next most. Um, I didn't mention in the introduction, but in, in my role at Oracle, I'm, I'm usually engaged with customers most of the time uh, in the field. So I've, over the last seven years, I've gotten to see a great number of industries, a great number of companies, a great number of projects, and seen what they're doing. And that's how I came up with these sort of prevalence orderings. Service response caching is third, and then the, the other three, work management, enterprise integration, and sort of simple state sharing are much less prevalent. But on the, on the motivation side, most of the time when, when um, companies adopt these technologies in a project, the, the first reason for doing it is for performance, meaning low latency data access. Um, second, second reason, and, and closely related, is scalability horizontally scaling a data management technology to allow low latency data access as load increases. Third, um, reliability and availability. Uh, the ability to survive um, the failure of a process or a machine uh, hosting some data um, or even survive the failure of a back-end data source that uh, an application ultimately depends on. And then finally, um, and, and interestingly, expense reduction, um, especially with the um, state sharing um, and service response caching uh, usage patterns, uh, customers are finding that they can avoid uh, calling expensive resources like mainframes, for example, or they can avoid having to scale up uh, uh, database tiers of architecture uh, to meet application load. So. Let's drill in on the, the most um, prevalent usage pattern, domain object storage. Can I just ask, how, how many of you in the audience uh, know what domain-driven design is? Okay, um, a, a minority, I would say. So domain-driven design is the name of an architecture style that was described by Eric Evans in a book in 2003. Um, it's, it's the architecture style that is kind of at the core of the object-oriented tradition. Um, it's that domain layer that's in between services and persistence. It features a, a model of the problem domain that's historically been expressed as, you know, POJO classes. And it, it's the architecture style that object persistence technologies have always been designed to support. Um, things like object databases, object relational mapping layers, the reason these things exist is because people were doing domain-driven design style applications. But interestingly, a pretty recent phenomenon is that the, the representations of domain models are starting to change. Um, domain models are starting to be expressed in um, XML documents, um, JSON, and it's a fair question to ask, well, what, what about the behavior side of things? But if you, if you ask Eric Evans what is really the essence of domain-driven design, it's mostly about getting a group of people, um, a group of stakeholders, to use the same language to describe the, the problem domain and the concepts in it and, and share an understanding of the meaning of those terms. That's really the essence of it. But anyway, here, here are some important concepts. And I know this is going to be hard to read for folks in the back of the room, but um, this is one of my favorite domain models. It's from an airline operations domain. and um, it has uh, the idea of a flight, um, and a flight has a, a one or more actual flight legs, um, and every flight leg has a scheduled flight leg, and as we all know, flights get delayed, and that's the difference between scheduled and actual. And um, every actual flight leg and every scheduled flight leg has a little tuple of four timestamps associated with it. Um, when your airplane pushes back from the gate, that's called the out time. When it lifts off the runway, that's called the off time. When it lands, that's on time. And when it gets to the gate, that's in time. And so um, if you've ever had an experience where an airplane pushes back from the gate and then goes back to the gate again, like a mechanical failure, um, that's actually two actual flight legs, each with its own time tuple and so on. And then air airplanes have crews, which consist of pilots. And pilots have trips, which are 
duty periods and layoffs. Um, so it's a very tangible domain model and the reason I like it is because it has a lot of the features of uh, domain driven design. Um, there are aggregation structures, um, existence dependencies. So for example, um, a pilot trip you know, strongly consists of these other objects and, and they would be um, created and destroyed together. So there, there are examples of um, value objects. You know, a time tuple doesn't have an identity. And it, it, you know, if, if two time tuples have the exact same state, um, they're substitutable for each other. But something like a, a scheduled flight leg absolutely has an identity. It's got a, a flight number and a date. And all, um, it, all aggregates have an entity a, as their root. And this, this becomes really important for NoSQL storage concepts. That's, that's why I'm going through this. So it turns out that there are a bunch of related patterns um, for domain object storage. I think there's potential actually for a pattern language here. Uh, a lot of times companies do domain model storage and NoSQL products um, for, for read caching. They, they want to um, read domain objects essentially from other sources, um, store them in a, in a data grid or similar um, for lower latency access. Th this is very popular in, in retail, for example. There are, there are a number of retailers that are using these kind of technologies to cache their product catalogs and, and serve their, their websites faster. Another related pattern is, is write buffering. Um, I know of several cases where um, companies are generating so much data that they're exceeding the write rate of the most um, capable database uh, stack in the world. Uh, uh, that's a full rack of exadata. I, I, know, I know companies that are uh, writing at a greater rate than a full rack of exadata can handle. And so they're, they're, they're doing write buffering in front of a full rack of exadata. Event processing, um, if you have a domain model cache and you have incoming sensor inputs that, that update the state of the domain model, that those are often used in comparison, and Chris will talk about this, or use it in conjunction, I should say. Grid computing, um, similar. Um, you can execute parallel distributed algorithms in a clustered um, data grid technology. There's a, there's a, a pattern, call, uh, it's in Martin's book, Materialized View. You may have one representation of a domain model that needs to be projected into another representation that's specifically designed for a certain query. And that synchronization of those two projections can be accomplished with eventing. So th there's key mapping as well, which Chris will get into. And then there are even other topics and patterns. Um, to do with, given a domain model, how, you, how do you store that in a, in a set of uh, caches or whatever abstraction your, your NoSQL technology gives you? They, they all have different names for, for the abstractions. Um, I, I intended to put in a chart uh, that compared the names to so the concept of like a database instance and a schema and a table and a row uh, roughly translated into what a document store gives you, what a key value store gives you, there are some, some correlations. And given a domain model, how you map that into the abstractions that your NoSQL technology gives you makes a big difference. Um, if you store entire object graphs together in, as one entry, or if you break up every entity and store them separately. And re depending on how you do that mapping, there, there are relationship handling patterns, and I know Chris is gonna go into this in great detail. There are also some really interesting transaction management patterns, um, which are discussed a little bit in Martin's book. Uh, ha having transactions that only operate on a single uh, key value um, cache entry or, or a single document is, is easy, but it's also not really real. Um, there are enough applications out there that have application transactions that need to modify multiple things at a time that you need atomic um, commits essentially into these kind of technologies. And that's, that's actually a hard problem. So um, finally there are some other patterns to do with where behavior lives now in, in, this, in this kind of world. You have an opportunity to put behavior into um, especially a data grid tier that used to be in an application server tier. And I know at least one uh, project using um, coherence that, that has moved the service layer into the data grid. 
So it's a really rich um, field in terms of potential pattern languages just in the area of the domain model storage usage pattern. Um, the other usage patterns are not quite so rich, but at this time uh, I'd like to turn the mic over to Chris and he can give you a, a detailed case study on what Nike has done in the last uh, year with their Nike Plus system. Cool, thanks. Yeah, so <clears throat> Nike Plus, if you guys, uh, does anyone, does everyone know what Nike Plus is? No? Yeah? Kinda? All right. Well, so for those who don't know, um, Nike Plus is what, at Nike what we call digital sport. So uh, about six years ago, we came out with a iPhone app for runners. You could run; it'll track your run on GPS. A um, couple years after that, we came out with a sports watch, GPS watch, like a Garmin. But of course, I think it's better because it's Nike. And you run with that, and you could plug it in; it would sync, and we'd get your GPS data. We'd show you maps of your runs and show you all kinds of cool aggregates and stuff. Um, and then a few years ago, uh, let me see, what's my, all right. Okay. A few years ago, uh, we took, took a look at what we had. We had millions of users. We had a new product that we wanted to build, the Fuel Band. And we had a bunch of other ideas. And we looked at what we had and where we wanted to go. And we thought, this system's just not going to scale to be what we wanted. So we started over. We kind of got to carve off a little section as a startup-ish kind of group inside of Nike. And we just built a new platform. Um, so it was a lot of fun and uh, learned a lot of lessons along the way. So I'm going to start with some of the lessons we learned when we were going through this whole process. Kind of the first thing, um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm going to dedicate this to Alex in the back of the room. Love your domain. Uh, what I mean by that, it goes back to domain-driven design and your domain model. Uh, so I saw. I don't know, hopefully, maybe you guys are just getting tired of seeing the conference, you're like, oh, I'm not going to raise my hand, uh, you know. <laughs> Your do domain model is really, really important when you go into building stuff in a NoSQL world. Um, if you think about, you know, uh, if you think about stuff from the database level first, you're probably going to get it wrong. Uh, because this is no <laughs> NoSQL. <laughs> you really need to think about your contracts, your domain, how are, how are people going to use this data, not how do I want to store this data. Um, it's, that's really key when you're starting off. Um, and then a couple of things to consider about that, version compatibility, how do you think the system's going to evolve? Like, do you know what you're doing? Do, are you kind of putting something out there for people to goof off with and you're going to try and change stuff as it rolls in production? Um, how's that going to work in the long run, version compatibility of your domain? Uh, Having a rich domain versus an anemic domain, we'll go into that a little bit. And the serialization, I mean, uh, NoSQL, you're going to have a bunch of network uh, uh, JVMs talking to each other. So you're, you're going to have to make sure you tackle the serialization and different, different kinds of NoSQL have different types of serialization. So it's something you really need to think about up front. Um, SQL, structured query language. No SQL. Be kind of really bad for querying, actually. Um, so you want to think about, uh, you know, we, we were thinking about this. You want to make sure you can get your objects based on their natural keys. It, it almost sounds obvious, but, uh, it, it, you know, it goes back to don't think about the database first. If you think about the database first, you're going to fall into this, oh, well, I'm just going to query for stuff. And when you've got a whole bunch of, do like, your domain objects sitting in this, nice place for super fast access, you just want to be able to get it real fast. Not ask like, hey, get me this, some long query or whatever. You want to know exactly what you want. So when you design your, um, your model, you want, to, you want to think about that stuff up front. Um, <clears throat> and remember, think differently. You know, I can't, I can't, I keep coming back to the database model because we, I mean, we've had a bunch of developers work on this project and I don't know how many times <laughs> we go back to the same problem. People, well, I'll query, no, you, that doesn't perform well. We know it. So um, uh, just because you have NoSQL as a data store doesn't mean it's a database. Um, you want to kind of think differently about this. So think about how you want to get this stuff um, really quickly and design for that. Uh, so having said that, then that kind of goes into how's your domain model going to look. 
Uh, you have like the rich domain versus the anemic domain, which is more of like a rich service model. So the two different, so uh, you know, since not a lot of people raise their hands talking about domain layers, rich domains are really great. Um, if you can get your objects by key, get everything you need in one big chunk, and, uh, and the objects know how to operate on themselves. So if you have some kind of um, operation that, you're, uh, that you want to do with your domain layer, it, you build that into the object. You can pull your object out, pull it out of your uh, NoSQL world, and you know, call methods right off that, let it do its own thing. Really great if you know what you want, if you've been able to design stuff um, uh, to be able to get your objects out immediately, let them do their own thing. The other way to think about it is having more of an anemic domain, which is good if you need a lot of logic at the service level. Um, so moves your logic out of the domain. Maybe it's a good idea if you've got really frequent domain changes, if you've got a lot of different views where you have to use builder patterns to put stuff together. Um, Maybe something you think of. We experimented with both and found use cases for each. Um, but it, it depends on the case. You definitely, but it's something you definitely want to consider and think about. And one thing that we did a, a bunch of, and we'll get into a little bit more, is connecting stuff, um, connecting stuff together with aspects. Makes stuff easier to write. Um, let the aspect manage the relationships. Developers can just write code put in aspects, annotations, and you can abstract your NoSQL implementation now. Um, earlier we were talking about JSR 107, 347, 347, 107. So hopefully soon we'll actually have a uh, standard for caching. And if we have that, then you'll be really happy you abstracted your stuff out. So talking about um, getting stuff by key, uh, Key objects, we went down the road of actually creating key-based objects. And the whole thought behind it was get everything by its natural key. Again, we don't want to have to query our cache. We don't want to have to query the grid for anything. Uh, we want to be able to say, okay, we know what we want. Here's the key. Just give me, give me everything in two hops. Because you would have like a service of some kind or your interface or view or whatever. Go to your key object, get your keys, and then go back and get all of your stuff. And it's okay to have a separate cache for keys. It's okay. It, it doesn't, uh... so one of the principles Martin Fowler mentioned is NoSQL is open source. Our stuff's not open source, <laughs> so I can't go into gritty detail, uh, but I kind of just drew up a parallel example. We kind of started like a startup-ish, so it's time for a startup company. So uh, in kind of a parallel thing that's a little bit different, imagine you've got users with profiles, kind of like a four square kind of thing. You've got a bunch of events. The more events you have, you can get trophies for stuff. Um, so you have kind of two different views to, to look at things. You can either um, go to, go to a, a user's profile, get all their trophies, get all their events, see all their buddies or whatever, and you can go to an event, get all the people that were there, get all the trophies that were accrued there, uh, or go to a marker, see all the events that were at that marker. So it's like, you know, the same data, but kind of in a kind of different view. Something that's really easy to fall in the trap of, well, I'm just gonna query by uh, event ID, or I'm just gonna query by this ID, um, which kind of ends up not working so well. So one way to tackle that problem and, you know, and if these are kind of your two different views, uh, yeah, if you're taking pictures of this, don't critique me too hard. I just really kind of put this together as an example. Um, two different kind of views to do things. Either you've got a user with multiple stuff in your domain or you've got a marker, you know, multiple users, multiple events, multiple trophies, multiple activities at, a, you know, basically a geolocation. Or you've got a user who's participated in multiple events, has multiple trophies, they've been in multiple activities, and they have marked multiple things. Um, so one way to be able to get this stuff really quickly is have basically different key-based objects that you can get all of your associated things in like the two gets. You know, going back to this, I mean, it's this, this kind of get all your keys and then just get all your 
objects with their natural keys. So uh, whenever you have related stuff, uh, if you want to get things by a marker, you can get your marker keys object, then based on your keys, you can get all the association. If you want to get a view based on a user, get your user keys, get all, get everything back by key. Um, by doing this, then you really avoid having to run queries, which is kind of neat. And then an easy way to manage this, so the keys end up getting populated, you know, you define the relationships beforehand, you populate your keys so you can um, be able to perform your gets off them pretty quickly. And uh, we designed aspects essentially to manage the relationship with the cache. So um, if you're programming and looking at the domain model, you might have like user dot get events or something like that. And for that, we've got an annotation that basically just abstracts all that cache stuff out. Um, or your NoSQL, your grid stuff. So you can just say, uh, you know, marker dot get users annotated with the cache getter annotation. And then that's smart enough to know, I've got a list of keys here stored. I'm going to go get my keys and then go get everything. Um, ends up being a really efficient kind of pattern to get data really quickly without having to run queries. Um, so that's kind of keys, objects, domain stuff. Then to talk a little bit too about um, something else which is, sorry. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, caching in caching in NoSQL is really really valuable. It's great. You get data really fast, really cool, um, really great for, for for performance. And then kind of another problem to solve is processing. How do you how do you manage all all this data? Um, like you know we get G, you know if someone goes for a seven mile run, we've got all the GPS coordinates for the run. Um, the fuel man tracks your activity all day, so we've got a whole lot of metrics. You plug this thing in your computer, you sync it through Bluetooth, we've got a lot of data to crunch. And then you take that and you figure out what achievements you get, um, what, uh, what trophies you might accrue, if there's any events going on, special things for the Olympics, all these kind of things. Um, we have to do a lot of processing on this data. If you're networked in with other people, how does your data relate to that? Um, so, NoSQL is awesome for doing like grid processing, the data grid kind of stuff. Asynchronous uh, processing kind of traditionally you handle it with JMS or something like that. I mean JMS is all right. After a while it gets kind of annoying. You have to worry about your connect. I mean, you know, kind of old JMS systems really get worse and worse over time. JBoss messaging. Uh, even like go with AQ, okay, yeah, AQ, that sounds great, I'm going to do everything in the database. Yeah, and then you're going to punish your database with all this queuing stuff. Uh, but it's asynchronous, great, and you're moving the processing kind of somewhere else off of the user's path. But, I mean, it's kind of annoying to maintain. So if you have an elastic data grid, you've actually got a ton of processing at your fingertips. Got all these little network JVMs that can do things, pretty convenient. Especially if your interface is already sitting on top of the grid, it's really great to just bloop, put something in there and let it do its thing. And NoSQL solutions are great for it. Process the data where it lives. Um, just scale your grid out <laughs> when you need more processing. And when it's done, you know, it's right there. So you don't have to worry about the old kind of JMS way. You know, application, you send it off to some kind of messaging processor, you know, it do its thing, goes back to the database and you have to re-get it later. Um, that's actually really annoying if you have a cache and you want data really fast because, you know, application one's going to do stuff. Uh, it's going to go to application two, it's going to process it with JMS. You have to go back to the database, you have to invalidate your cache. Um, uh, another old way to do stuff is using stored procedures um, for heavy lifting. Again, a pretty big bottleneck. If you've got a lot of data to process, uh, stored procedures sound great. Oh, you, oh man, a stored procedure on next data, that's going to be awesome. Mm, yeah, mm, uh, you actually, when you process a lot of data, that's going to punish your database. And if that's your central point of data, it's going to slow everything else down. So, really bad for scale. If you have a grid, then it's really great to 
take your stuff, plop it in the grid. You can scale your uh, nodes up and down as you want, and you can do your processing right in there. Go back to the database when you need to. Not a big deal. Um, uh, and then, you know, kind of a common way to do this, you've got some kind of uh, dispatcher, send it off, you've got a process listener living in your grid, you get your process, um, and you'll need some kind of job indicator, most likely, like if uh, um, you're sending data back to your platform, it's processing stuff, you're probably gonna have an interface that actually cares when it's done to tell the user something useful. Um, and so that's either gonna have to pull or have some kind of event sent back so it knows to do something. I called it the done checker, probably not a very great name. Um, but that'll get your status back and then whatever you have, whatever your job indicator does, whether that sends an event off to your interface or you've got some kind of web service pulling it or something like that, then you know the process is done. And you can always monitor your, now, there's lots of ways to monitor the grid to figure out if you need to scale or not, but kind of the length of time it takes your job indicator to change statuses is usually a pretty good indicator of is your grid big enough, is it processing fast enough, what's it doing? Um, yeah, so those are my patterns I wanted to talk about. Thanks, Chris. Sure. So uh, as you saw, they, they did a um, pretty interesting implementation of relationship management on Nike+. Plus. Um, we kind of uh, went through it pretty quickly, but when, when you have a domain model with one-to-many and many-to-many many -many relationships in it and you want to store it in a NoSQL store or a mem in-memory data grid, you have to make decisions about um, how am I going to uh, navigate those relationships um, from my application code. And there's really only three ways to do it, and I had a, a, just a pattern name for each. You can, um, you, you can serialize everything together. Um, uh, like a user and his trophies, or you can have a separate um, cache or collection, whatever the right term is, given the technology you're using, one for users, one for trophies, and then you have to have a way of getting all the trophies for a user, so you can either um, uh, query the trophies cache for the user ID, if each trophy knows what, what user he's for, or you can have a, a list of trophy IDs in the user object, and then when you read the user, you get all the trophy IDs, and you do a, a get all, essentially, from the trophies cache. And the third possibility is something like a relationship object, which is kind of necessary for many-to-many -many relationships, where you have a, a cache of those, and, and you, you query the cache. So what, what, what Chris has done is, is they've come up with an annotation-driven way of um, navigating relationships where the objects are mapped to different caches. And I know there's one other uh, user in the room here who has done a, a similar thing. So th th these kinds of um, problems are emerging and, and um, solutions being um, invented. Uh, I have a, a friend who, who uses MongoDB, and they, they have a similar problem. They have inter-document references expressed as URL, uh, uh, URLs, um, identifying related documents in different collections. So they, they have the exact same problem. So we, um, we spent most of our time on domain object storage patterns and, and case study intentionally because it's the most prevalent uh, usage pattern for this kind of technology. But I do want to cover some of the other ones. Uh, and, and save some time for Q&A. So let me drill into session state management. Um, th this is probably a very familiar uh, picture to everybody. You, you have a cluster of application servers with some applications deployed. They have sessions in them. It doesn't really matter if it's the serverless spec HTTP session or if it's your own abstraction of a session. You generally have some data that, that belongs to the session. And uh, th these, these can be... Uh, uh, very heap consuming, uh, d depending on the UI framework you're using. Um, it's not unheard of to have 50 megabyte sessions. It's not a unheard of to have session state exhausting app server heaps, limiting the number of concurrent sessions you can run from a given app server. So with session state management um, usage pattern, what happens is session state is moved to um, a, a backing store. And you may still have a small cache in the application server um, of small or frequently used session state items. So the, the motivations for doing this are, are slightly different than the other motivations I went through uh, earlier for NoSQL usage patterns in general. 
they are usually scalability. You want to be able to serve more concurrent sessions from a given application server instance than you could without managing session state in a NoSQL store. And they also may include operational um, benefits, operational efficiencies, like being able to hot deploy a new release of your application without losing sessions. And we even have examples of, of companies that are um, replicating session state between sites. That companies running multi-site active-active architectures and replicating session state between sites so that a user session may um, get directed from one site to another without any disconcerting experience. So that's, that's the session state management uh, usage pattern. Uh, there, are, there are some performance considerations that I'd like to point out with this, uh, just, just um, to be candid. Since you're taking state that used to be locally uh, accessible in process and you're moving it to another process, accessing that state now, now costs an inter-process communication and it's going to be higher latency. Um, so yes, you can have more concurrent sessions than the app server, but accessing the state of each session might take a little bit longer. And that might um, translate to uh, slightly higher response time um, from the application server to a, to a user interface. And it might also tra translate to lower throughput, uh, request throughput of the application server. So the, the, the motivation for doing this is, is going to be things like um, more concurrent sessions per app server, uh, operational benefits, and uh, in comparison to um, hoping for higher performance from this. So service response caching, this is uh, uh, very effective. We, we, uh, we have so, some pretty good examples of this. It's, it, it's a, it's a uh, pattern where um, a client of a service uh, checks a cache first to see if a service response is already in the cache, and if not, calls the service, gets the response, puts it in the cache, and returns it. Uh, and then the subsequent request can hit the cache. Um, this is a, a classic uh, cache aside pattern. Um, it requires that you're able to compute um, a cache key from the incoming request. And it also raises uh, some interesting invalidation requirements. So for example, uh, if you're caching some kind of a document, let's say, let's say an XML document that you got from some kind of SOAP service, um, that XML document uh, may have been composed, may have been rendered from some domain object graph. And if any one of those underlying domain objects changes subsequent to rendering the document, that means the document is stale now. And so you, you have to keep track of um, the um, dependencies of documents on uh, objects. So th this, this can actually be done with a, a key value store. You can have a, a, a cache in a key value store where for each domain object, you're keeping a list of documents that have been rendered from that domain object. Um, and if a domain object happens to change, you can go to this list of documents and invalidate the, the documents cache, the service response cache, uh, for all documents that depend on that domain object. I know uh, a retailer um, right here in San Francisco that's doing this to purge Akamai. They, they, it's not, it, they're doing it with web pages um, that have product inventory on them, but when product inventory changes, they, they go purge Akamai of that web page, and they, they're keeping track of what pages depend on what product inventory objects with a, a little cache like this. Um, we have a customer in the hotel reservations um, industry who is doing this with hotel availability queries. And their, their, their clients are Orbitz, Expedia, Kayak, et cetera, et cetera. So the, their, their position in their, in their industry value chain, uh, their system is just getting hammered with hotel availability queries all the time. And if they have to call a back-end um, central reservation system to get the answer to an availability query, they cache the answer. And the next time... Uh, uh, same availability query comes, they can return it from cache. And, and that, their, their capacity to do that is directly related to their, um, their performance as a business. So that's uh, service response caching. It's a very simple usage pattern, um, but very effective in, in uh, some situations. Finally, work management. This is a, 
more rare, but um, some good examples. Uh, you can use a, a NoSQL store or a, um, an in-memory data grid to basically coordinate a lot of work and coordinate um, passing jobs to workers, um, holding the inputs for the job, capturing the outputs from the jobs. So th this diagram is actually from a coherence user that has um, a farm of about 1,000, 1,500 worker processes that are, that are doing um, analysis of variance computations. And they have a pretty small um, cluster of coherence and a couple of uh, application servers that on-queue jobs. And when a job is on-queued, these worker processes compete to consume it. One of them gets it, um, does the computation, puts the results back, and then competes to con consume the next one. Um, these guys are, are executing analysis of variance calculations at a rate of uh, uh, several hundred per second with this architecture. Um, and it's a very large deployment of um, um, coherence extend clients. Um, so this is one of the more advanced work management use cases that, that we know of. Uh, and that's, I think, um, the, the end of the, the usage patterns. I'd, I'd like to just go back and, um, uh, for memories, j just to uh, jog our memory, show you the whole list again. So we went through um, a little bit of diagram, a little bit of example of every one of these except enterprise integration. And this is what we have seen emerge in the last um, three to five years um, working with uh, in-memory data grids and, and NoSQL. So at this time, I'd like to open the floor to questions. We have about seven minutes left in the hour. Um, any questions, any comments out there? Yes. The what? Sure. Sure. So um, if you're familiar with uh, Gregor Hope and Bobby Wolf's Enterprise Integration Patterns book, they describe a pattern in there called competing consumers. Um, it, it's based on an older messaging paradigm, but when, when, a, when a message is published, um, consumers compete to consume the message, and the first one that gets it um, does whatever uh, the message entails. So in this case, the workers are, are notified of a job awaiting execution through an eventing model. It, it's not messaging, it's an it's eventing feature in, in the in-memory data grid. So all the, the, the workers are JVMs, and they all get a notification of a, of a job insertion into a queue. And they all attempt to claim the job concurrently, and only one of them wins. And when it wins, it, it changes its state from idle to busy and proceeds to execute the job. And then um, when it's done, it caches the results and changes its state back from uh, busy to idle. The question was, uh, just could I elaborate on the, the worker processes? So these are, these are Java virtual machines um, running in a Sun grid engine deployment. Um, and they're uh, sort of dynamically started en masse. Um, and this, this company is now getting into uh, predictive um, provisioning of how many worker processes they'll need uh, based on sort of upstream indicators of the amount of work that's coming. Uh, yes. Yes, um, this company reported at Open World on Monday or Tuesday that they are getting nine times more throughput with this architecture than they've ever gotten before. And it, is, is it because uh, everything is in the memory or is it because of just the nature of noise? Uh, I think it's the, uh, the ability to um, pass jobs and associated data to and from the workers faster um, 
uh, via data grid than they could via relational database. No, go ahead. Uh, um, most most data grids are are in memory. Yeah, I mean the 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 uh, it's basically network speed instead of potentially disk speed. So if, uh, is that a single point of failure? Then? Because if uh, if that you know, is it, are we assuming that there will always be a cluster? Yeah, one of the things that uh, Martin's book describes in in really good detail is the is the concepts of of replication and and quorums. So um, most of these kind of technologies um, are, are fail-safe. They, they can uh, survive the failure of a process or a machine by having enough replicas elsewhere in the cluster um, that if there is a failure, the, the data can be accessed from just one of the duplicate locations. Let me move on to your question. Well, actually, let me, let me jump in real quick on that because, uh, sorry. Um, yeah. yeah, no, but it's a, it's a really good point because it is possible it is possible to bring a whole grid down. It is great to have like the redundant JVM. So, if, you know, one goes down. Uh, if you got like I don't know 100, one goes down. You've got 99. They can rebalance, and you're cool. But if something goes catastrophically wrong in your entire, you know, it is possible that if I mean, if your system's designed to always just get data from there, it, it really is a single point of failure. So, I mean, if you're designing large systems, it's always good to keep in mind. You know what? What happens if this goes down? Do I have a fallback? Maybe performance will suck if I just hit the database, but is that still possible to do in your architecture? So it's, it's a good call. Is this expected to be a running project? Like, is Yeah, in terms of operating these kinds of systems, um, not everyone has to be continuously available, but um, Chris, for example, they, they want their application to be continuously available, and, and there, there are certain events that currently require a cold start. At, at least, let, let me speak specifically to coherence now. Um, changing, uh, upgrading a major version upgrade of coherence requires a cold start. Um, most other things ideally could be done with a rolling restart. Um, we, it's also a very common practice to do blue-green deployment, if, if you're familiar with that. If you, it's on Martin Fowler's blog. Um, it's basically the idea of running two silos and bleeding traffic between silos. That's, that's probably the most common approach to continuous availability that, that I've seen. Um, go ahead. Um, you're Just, saying that the NoSQL is not good for play. And hmm. uh, can the two uh, for some uh, object, so for some uh, uh, domain, object of the domain, we can use uh, the traditional SQL, and for other, uh, use the NoSQL. Maybe I'm not thinking different, but I think sometimes uh, I need query in, in my application. So if you go by Martin Fowler's definitions of key value stores, it's key-based access only, and document stores have query features that know, how, that know something about the content of the um, document, so to speak. And um, so I, I don't want to imply that all no NoSQL technologies have any query capabilities because NoSQL technologies do have query capabilities. But I think one of the hard problems is the query capabilities are not designed to join, like jo join documents across collections of documents, join um, values in a key value store across different caches. Um, so th there are there are emerging other technologies that um, can do. Um, full SQL join type queries against a relational database and still attempt to leverage the benefits of caching. For example, um, there's a Hibernate grid that's starting to come out. Oracle has had a top link grid out for a few years that um, it's basically the um, integration of object relational mapping and in-memory data grids. So the, it's a JPA provider that um, can can uh, query the cache when 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 possible, but if the query is too complex, it'll delegate the query to the database, and then and then um, 
put the results in cache. So that there's a, there are quite a few usage patterns there that are kind of beyond the scope of, of this talk or uh, kind of narrower focus than this talk. And it's also possible to have like a, um, have a cache with your relationships kind of pre-populated into it. So if you need to join, you know, different caches, if you have, you can have a separate kind of cache that has the relationships between the caches. So you can still kind of do the key pattern. You just have to make sure it's built into, you know, all those relationships are kind of built into your domain model. I know that kind of in our implementation, querying was really bad. I, you know, doesn't mean it's always bad. I personally don't like it because it's caused me personal pain. But uh, I mean, if there's definitely querying that you need in your architecture, every of course every case is different. I would try. There are cases where you know we we use the database for specific things, and we just try to make sure we you know I don't want to say contain it or isolate it, but you know design in such a way where you know, we maybe just don't need it for really, really fast access of things, especially when the system's under a lot of load that typically is our biggest bottleneck. So I think there was someone in the back of the room. Yes, I'm trying to go in order, sorry. Uh, I was not able to hear the question. Ah. Yeah, yeah, so the, that introduction slide. Um, What's the question? The question was, what was the problem that um, was being solved by the architecture that featured Hadoop and a data grid, if I, if I understand you correctly? Yeah, so that particular company um, had to do, they, they had to do a big data computation job and then cache the results of the computation. So, so, um, I'll describe just quickly about what that web application did. So if, if you want to go find out who's been searching for you on the internet, that's, that's the answer they were providing. So like, let, let's, say, let's say I go do a search for Chris Davis. Good luck. And, and you, and you go do a search for Chris Davis. And, and we happen to know that he lives in Portland and he's you know, 30 years old or whatever. Um, so um, a bunch of us do a search for Chris Davis. And now, now tomorrow, Chris Davis wants to know, you know, who's been searching for me? Well, the, what Hadoop is doing is it's saying, all right, um, I had 100 searches for Chris Davis. Who, who were all the searchers? So that, that's, that's the map reduce problem. Um, for every person that was searched for, give me all the searchers that were searching for them. So that what they were caching in, in, in the data grid was a who searched for you record. So if, if Chris logs into this web app tomorrow and, and says who's been searching for me, he, he, the who searched for you records are, are cached. Um, so that, that, was the, that was the problem they were solving. So I think if you have a, a massive computation job where you want the results of the computation to be quickly accessible, that's the justification for that architecture. Um, you had a question. So my question is uh, for Chris, uh, and it's regarding the key architecture which you have like in the system. So do you use some sophisticated project for generating the key so it's going to be some new conventional to uh, in the key or just one of the keys? question was, uh, does Nike have a sophisticated approach for key generation? We do have a, well, uh, well, for key generation, all of our keys are GUIDs. Um, and yeah, uh, so w what we do is kind of behind all of our objects, you know, at some point we have to go back to the database to get stuff to bring it into the cache anyway. So we do have like, basically, um, we've got key objects that manage relationships and we've got relationship caches that manage relationships. So we can always go back, um, you know, if you think about kind of users and events. Every time a user does something, it can be categorized as an event, all kinds of stuff. I went for a run, I made a friend, I got a trophy, all this stuff. Um, lots of events, users, and then they're all related to different things. So, I mean, we, we've got a cache that contains relationships just between kind of different objects. So if we've got an object key and we want to say, I want users to events, I can just go to my kind of relationship bucket and say, okay, I've got this key, what are all the relationships, and then use that to get corresponding caches. In the case where, and that's if things aren't already kind of lumped together. 
So the session ended five minutes ago. Uh, I think we should cut it off and release everyone to happy hour. Thank you very much for attending. Appreciate it.